All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz. It's good to have you here. It's good to be here. I'm going to introduce a brand new guest for the show in just a minute, but a couple of housekeeping notes as we get started. First of all, if you are listening to the audio version of this after the fact, do know that we stream every one of our Boca Podcast episodes live now on Facebook at facebook.com slash Boca Podcast. And then on YouTube, youtube.com slash Boca Podcast. And of course, you can subscribe and turn on notifications there on YouTube and keep up to date not only with the episodes that go out, but also the announcements that we push out as well. Make sure to subscribe and turn on those notifications there. And we want you to come be a part of the conversation. It's one of the major benefits of doing these live streams is you can come and ask the guests that I'm interviewing questions, engage, make this a group discussion. I hope that you'll do that. And for any of you that have logged on live today, don't hesitate to do the same thing. Ask questions, make comments. You can send us funny emojis even if you'd like to do just that. Um, one other note here before I introduce my new guest for today, as I promised I would do before every Boca podcast episode, I made a, a donation, a small donation to Charity Water today. And of course, for those of you that are new to the conversation, I only bring this up because I wanna continue to encourage all of us, myself included, to remind us and encourage us to look for opportunities to give back. It doesn't take a lot of money to make a big difference in other people's lives. And so look for those local community organizations or national or international organizations, look for opportunities to give back as you have the opportunity to do so. And um, I, I think collectively we can make a really big difference. All right. Well, on that note, I want to, speaking of making a big difference, I wanna introduce our special guest for today, I'm joined by Clark Sanders. Clark, thank you for coming to hang out with me on the Boca Podcast today. Hey, it was an honor to get invited, I promise. <laughs> well, it's it's a privilege for us, and I want to give a little bit of context. So first of all, it, you said kind of a funny comment before we got started, and I could absolutely feel what you were saying. You said, I wish I could click on my screen. You, you've got a MacBook Air there to mm -hmm. adjust the exposure to, to the image. Uh, we've got yeah. a kind of a, a lighting situation we were trying to refine before we got started. It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. We can yeah. still hear you. We can still have conversations, so we're good to go. Um, <laughs> but that being said, we, we've had the opportunity recently, and I'm just going to pop this up on uh, the screen. Sportsextractions.com is a brand that we recently launched. Uh, we'll call it a sister company of Photographer's Edit. And we're, we're here ultimately to kind of change the way that the extractions industry and ultimately sports photography industry handles post-production. It's been kind of a dated process for some time, and we want to step in the game and, and change things up a little bit. All that said... If anybody listening in or watching goes to sportsextractions.com right now, Clark has been gracious enough as we are getting the business and the brand launched, has been gracious enough to allow us to use a lot of his images. So to give context to the conversation that we're going to be getting into today, which is how to bring dramatic lighting to sports teams as you're photographing sports teams, you can go see many examples of Clark's work if you go to sportsextractions.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at sportsextractions. But enough of the, the little plug there, Clark. I actually want to bring everybody over to your website. And I'm going to br actually pull this up on screen here really quick. Um, for anybody listening in or watching, ClarkSandersPhotography.com. And you'll immediately see that we're talking to not only an experienced, but a talented photographer here whose commentary on lighting today um, is exemplified over and over and over again. Just beautiful use of light in his work there at clarksandersphotography.com. You can also go to instagram.com slash Clark Sanders and see more of it. All right, Clark, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop rambling on and talking here. Um, I would love for you just to briefly introduce not only yourself, but the brand. We talk a lot about brand position here at the podcast. What is your business's brand position in your local market? Well, it's something that it's, taken me a long time to try to figure out what it really is and or to come up with a style and over the years learning off-camera lighting and just loving it and loving how it can set images apart from a lot of folks that's a big part of it and being able to provide um, images you know senior portraits or sports portraits or whatever that look different than uh, just a lot of people's and not to bash natural light photography at sure. all because yeah. you can find some gorgeous natural light images and but using the studio lights when i do outside there's I, you can just take it to another level and one of my my slogans on my website is on there somewhere i forget where it's at but it's um to um um 
it's like senior portraits with a cinematic flair. And that's what I kind of want to make them look that way. So it's a little different than what you would normally get. And that's kind of what mine is. I mean, it's, I'm here in my studio and I don't do a ton here in the studio, but um, it's just fun to take the studio outside. And I like, I like that commentary actually take the studio outside. And, and again, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just going to jump back over here to your site as we're, as we're talking, I'm scrolling through. So anybody who's listening to the audio version of this, we're currently scrolling through Clark's website, clarksandersphotography.com. And you'll see exactly what Clark is talking about. There is an, a, a certain drama to the lighting Clark, but it really does feel like we're, we're literally seeing a studio translated outside. I pulled this one image up here of who I'm assuming is a senior standing yes. next to his Jeep. And it literally looks like you're in a studio. The way that you've lit this so beautifully, you can see the ambient light in the background, beautiful reflection off the water. And yet the individual is lit in a way that looks like, you know, one of those movie sets where they've got the, you know, the big screens up to try to block out the sun and just beautifully directionally lit. It's, it's really, really, truly well done. I've been in photography Thank now you. for uh, I guess 20 years or so I've been in the industry and it, it's a little bit tough at times to see, or actually, let me rephrase it. You see a lot of times to your point, um, natural, so-called natural light photography that leaves a lot to be desired. There's certainly some beautifully handled natural light imagery, but a lot of times if you're going outside, especially in bright, harsh sunlight, it can be really tough to manage that. And you mm -hmm. have exemplified in your work here how to do so. So we're going to talk about the technical side of that here in just a few minutes. We'll get to that in just a second. By the way, we already had a comment on YouTube. Daniel said, Clark is the goat. So you've got some fans <laughs> out there, apparently, Clark. <laughs> Thanks for commenting, Daniel. And uh, again, for anybody who's listening, watching live, we have others I, I see here. Please don't hesitate to comment, ask questions as we go along here, because I know Clark has a lot to offer, especially when it comes to the technical side of lighting. Clark, I want to ask you another question here, just continuing to move along. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about your, I guess the principle, the primary principle that drives your approach to customer experience. How do you provide the best possible customer service to your clients? Well, one of the things that I've done for, I've been in business full-time for 10 years. Um, I've been doing photography for 20 this year, actually. Um, and one of the things that has really set me apart is doing in-person sales. And it's just another level of customer service because I mean you can pop your images online which I used to do a long time ago and put them in a gallery for people to order I would sit and wait for orders to come in and sit and wait for money to come in and making the leap full-time I couldn't do that so I switched my business model to I thought well, hey it's going to be a little more better customer service on my part yeah. being able to do the session and then schedule their ordering appointment and know, hey, that day that ordering appointment is taking place, I'm getting money in, I'm getting some cash flow. Yeah. And that made the world a difference. And then being able to guide the client through, you know, picking out certain images and, you know, being able to, you know, pop them on the screen at the same time and let them compare ones they like to others. And, and it made it a lot a better opportunity for me to upsell to selling albums and canvases and basically what I have learned is you sh sell what you show and what mm -hmm. I had on display a lot of people would buy and so it that has been helpful and I've had it's basically like a three a t meet with them prior to the session I meet with them during the session at the ordering appointment and then when they come back to pick up their order and there are times that it's more convenient. I'll make the delivery myself if I'm in the vicinity where they live. So. Sure. But would you say, I mean, a lot of photographers, myself included, by the way, and I've said this on the podcast before, I intentionally, myself and my business partner at the time chose not to get into IPS. And we were working with a gallery at the time, an online gallery called Pictage that would kind of automatically sell the images or prints for us. And mm -hmm. they'd send out these emails and run sales and this kind of thing. And it, and it made it easy for us. But I know in hindsight, especially talking to photographers like yourself, that we missed out on a lot of revenue as a result of really kind of, I guess, in a lot of ways, just being too lazy to get into IPS, taking the time mm -hmm. to do this type of work. So to that end, would you say, what would you say, first of all, 
um, if, if you were to kind of come up with a, 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 about a percentage, just guesstimating what the percentage is, how much did your sales increase when you jumped to IPS? I hear, I mean, I've, I've attended conferences like crazy and you hear people say, oh, they went up a hundred percent and the sales go up depending on how your pricing is structured. Okay. Cause when I started out, my pricing was extremely low and I had attended a workshop. My wife actually went with me. Um, it was in 2007, right before I decided to make the jump full time. We attended a workshop in Morton, Illinois, that was put on by Jed and Vicki Toffer yeah. at their their um, studio. And we were showing pricing and everything. And she saw mine and slapped my hand and said, you're going to have to raise your prices. You're not going to be able to make it. So, And that was mm. one of the, besides quitting my full-time job to do this, raising my prices where I did was one of the scariest things that I had to do. Mm. But it made a world of difference. And that that alone with in-person sales, I'm, I'm, I'm in confident saying that they probably went up double, if not more than wow. that. Wow. Because you're here and then you're able to, when people see things online without you there to explain them or, you know, talk it up, it's just, it's so much easier when they're here in person that I can talk to them and say, here's why this one costs this, or here's the difference between the two. So it's, it makes it a whole lot easier when you're trying to sell things too. And I never thought I'd see myself as a salesperson, <laughs> but yeah. when you do something that you love and you love the end result mm. of the images and you want them to have them and mm -hmm. they like them too. So it makes it a little easier. That's interesting. I, you're right. I, I, I can, well, I say you're right. I can relate to what you're saying is a better way to, to, to put it in that. I don't feel like a salesperson, but when it comes to talking about photographers edit, for example, I can speak genuinely and passionately from the heart, from personal experience as a photographer, mm -hmm. from a, an extreme internal desire to not be stuck behind the computer for the sake of the important relationships in my life. I can talk about these things naturally and it's, it's not forced. Mm -hmm. And I see the real benefit because of my personal experience. So it doesn't feel like a sales pitch at that point. It feels like I'm, I'm trying to help somebody else, a photographer specifically help their life become better through the service. So it, it doesn't feel forced. And I wonder if photographers who are apprehensive either because they, they feel like they're introverts and they're not comfortable around people or because they just don't feel like a salesperson, if they kind of shifted the way that they frame that sales session into mm -hmm. simply communicating what it is that they're passionate about and the importance of prints, to mm -hmm. that client, if that might just make things easier for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say, funny you say, you know, introverts, because there, um, there are days that I'm extremely introverted and I just don't want to be around people. And there are days that I'm not. And there's, when I'm doing a session, I turn it off. And I'm like, when I'm, I did a senior session yesterday, and I'm sure the senior boy and his mother was like, would you just, quit talking. <laughs> I was like, I can't help it. You know, it's yeah. just, it's just a automatic thing, but, um, and getting, we'll get into lighting in a little bit, but one of the major people that really influenced how I learned the lighting was, uh, Zach Arias. And I loved his, uh, one light workshop. I've yeah. it on, I had it on DVD. I wore the thing out DVD, basically. Yep. Yep. And he, one of the things he would say is you got to get out of your head hmm. and if you're, you got to be able to talk to people. It's going to make it awkward for them when you're doing a session and you're not talking to them. And I'm constantly, you know, saying, you know, good job, good job. Or, you know, Hey, this looks great. This looks great. All this, you know, just trying to keep the energy up basically when and that's we're it. doing it. So they can, one of, one of my things is like yesterday I had a senior boy, when we were finished, the mom was like, we did some baseball images. So, and I got some really cool ones. So one, watch my Instagram today. Cause it's going to be one from that. But, um, it was so much fun and he had a great time and she was said, he, he talked about it when he got home. And I thought to me, that was a successful photo session 100%. when a senior boy enjoyed it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So well, and speaking I, from experience of my son was a senior last year, he did oh, not enjoy okay. it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a tough sell, right? You got to, yeah. you have to photograph your own son. I, I know from experience as well. So my kids are, uh, well, my son's a sophomore in college now and my daughter is a junior in high school. 
And um, anytime it, it comes time for pictures, at least most of the time anyway, if we're going to set anything up and take it, it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you make well, a couple of interesting points that I want to get back to very quickly. So first of all, the significance of energy. And we've talked a lot mm -hmm. about this here on the podcast, but it really, it, even if we're just having a conversation with someone, but especially a teenager, mm -hmm. if we don't bring energy to that conversation, they're checked mm -hmm. out right away. Oh yeah. And that's yeah. just reality. But I think people in general that way, and in many cases, mm -hmm. and if so, again, back to that notion of being genuine, if we are genuinely excited about this, and it's on us to put mm -hmm. ourselves in the right frame of mind for that purpose. But if we're mm -hmm. genuinely excited about what it is that we're what we do generally, and then what we're about to do in the case of an individual session, the person on the other side of that is going to feel that, sense that, and it's going to change the experience. So that's a great reminder. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I think this, this is a much more loaded topic. Maybe we can come back to in a different episode at, at some point if you're, if you're game to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. We might have to, we might have to come back here because this is really yeah. interesting. I, I just the little bit that I know you, Clark, um, it, I mean, I see this beautiful, beautiful work, but I, I know that, as you say, you, you're a little bit more introverted, at least at times. The fact mm -hmm. that you just choose to kind of change the behavioral patterns and step out of that introversion and mm -hmm. engage in IPS to the extent that it you know, doubles or more your sales, mm -hmm. and ultimately you're able to, to continue to work with these clients and produce beautiful work. Uh, there's just a lot there to unpack, and I think it would mm -hmm. be really great to get into that in more detail at a future date. But for today, right. I, I, I do want to get on um, here because we have a lot to cover with regards to the technical side of this. Before we do that, talk to me a little bit about time management. And you, you've already alluded to your family. You're running a business full time. You have family, other friends, those that are close to you. Of course, it takes time just to run a business in general. So I'm, I'm curious how you have effectively managed time. And I know it's an ongoing challenge for all of us, but mm -hmm. is there an idea that has driven your ability to better manage time so you don't get kind of burnt out and overwhelmed in the process? Well, a lot of it, I mean, I've heard people that talk about scheduling your own time, put, put it in your calendar. And I do that a lot of times. Um, this month and next month are my absolute busiest times of the year. And so I'm, my wife will joke a lot of times and say, yep, this is a month I'm a photography widow. And so she's home by herself, you know, because I don't usually work weekends. The only time I do a weekend mm -hmm. shoot is I'll do a senior rep program each year. And a lot of the uh, sessions that I'll do on a weekend, maybe a, on a, I actually have two this Saturday, but they're both, they, were, they would be for my senior reps or for past clients that have been really good clients. And so I'll make exceptions for that. But most of the time, if someone wants a session on the weekend, if it's in the summer or what, schedules are typically more flexible then because school's not in session. But I just say, well, I don't schedule things on the weekends because I like to use that time for my family, or I say that time's already taken. Sometimes they don't have to know what it's taken for. Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's just a matter of you've got to set your own time there because I mean, I don't compare what I do to say going to the doctor, you know, um, but you can't just call up your doctor and said, I really want to come in to see you, but I'd really it'd be better if I could come in on Sunday. You know, that's not going to work, <laughs> sure. you know, so it, you, you've got control of your own time and your yeah. own schedule. So you just got to, you know, I've, I've learned that when I tell people, I say, I'm sorry, I don't, I can't on Saturdays, that's my time with family. They immediately say, oh, that's, that's totally fine. I get it. You know, so they try to make time during the week that they can. So, and like this, like I said, this month's my busy month. Hmm. My son's birthday is on the 26th, which is a Tuesday. That day's blocked off for him. So we're, you know, taking off and spending as much time as we can with him that day. And we do the same for our daughter, if, you know, depending on when it falls, she's out of college and working. So, you know, a lot of times we'll spend a weekend with her. So, yeah, well, I, I, I love the simple notion and it's interesting how our conversations here on the podcast, come, a lot of times just come back to these very basic, simple principles, and it's good to be reminded of them in this case. Be intentional about time management. I, I think there is a tendency just in general, not just with time management in general in our lives, at least in American culture in 2021, you see this, even if you just scroll through Facebook for a little while, this kind of tendency that, that people have to, to react to life, react to the world mm -hmm. as though they have absolutely no choice in the matter. 
as to how they react to the world. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that we do have this really cool thing called choice. We can choose how to spend our time. We can choose how to block off our calendar and we can ultimately be more intentional in the way that we're managing our time. And this notion that we, it's so easy to, to give to other people. I'm sure you've heard it endless times, Clark. I know I have. You get this from other people. They're like, I'm, I'm busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. And the reality is in most of those cases, they're just too busy for us in that moment. And if they wanted to, they could schedule that time. And that's really the case for anything. If we are mm -hmm. intentional with our time, we can choose ultimately how to spend it. And this is just a good reminder in that regard, especially when it comes to making sure that we don't lose sight of what really matters, those important relationships right. in our lives. So I, I appreciate mm -hmm. that reminder. I want to kind of segue from that though, because one of the most important elements of time management as business owners, um, it certainly can be delegation, right? We delegate mm -hmm. maybe administrative tasks, delegate album design, del delegate editing, delegate accounting. I mean, there's, the list goes on. Is this something that you've experimented with in your business? Have you found any success in that regard? One of the main things that I did w when I knew I was going to be doing this full time was there are certain things that you invest your money in that you hate to let go of the money, but at the end, it's worth it. And that has been an accounting firm. Mm. And uh, I, I'll i do my own invoicing and sure. stuff like that, which is easy. I use QuickBooks online and it's easy to do. I do my own sales tax. I pay my own sales tax every month. Yeah. But as far as my payroll tax for myself, all the other stuff, mm -hmm. they it's, I use the online version for a reason because my accountant can go in and pull what they need and get what they need. They take care of all the other stuff. And I thought, I'd rather pay somebody that knows what they're doing to keep me out of trouble because I don't want to mess any of that up. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. So but I'm, I'm that's that one of the main things. Well, in that online version of QuickBooks, I, I compared to what it used to be, you talked about CDs earlier. So I remember mm -hmm. back in the days, this is like 2000, I don't know, three, four, maybe. QuickBooks, like you had, you had disks that you had to install mm -hmm. the software on your computer. And then if you wanted to share the QuickBooks file with your accountant, you had to burn that to a CD and give yeah. that to your accountant. Now, not only is the user interface way, way, way simplified in comparison, it's so much easier mm -hmm. for people that really don't have any idea what accounting is, it, it, they've made it easier to use. But like you said, it's also easy then to invite your accountant in or to give them access mm -hmm. to that and they can help you manage it. And yeah. it, it's such a, both, both a great reminder to, to take advantage of the great tools that we have out there, but also to use mm -hmm. tools that enable us to be able to, to delegate more effectively. That's great. Yeah. I'll date myself here, but I remember when I very first started, I thought I got to keep track of this stuff. I used a program called Peachtree Accounting. I don't even know if it's still around or yep, not. I remember it. it. But it was it was one of, one of those things. competitors at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> so many old school things. It's like, OK, because I, I mean, I started out when I my business first started back in the early 2000s. I shot film all the time. And now I have I haven't picked up a film camera and I can't tell you when. But <laughs> Same on both accounts. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Okay. I, I remember. I remember. Yeah. Times yeah. change. But I, I think to your point again, uh, before I go to the next question, I think it's a good reminder for all of us listening in that there are easy to use tools accessible now that cost us little to nothing that enable us to more efficiently run our business, to stay on top of things like paying sales tax or invoicing in a way that's really, really neat. And that we have all our information records collected there that we can easily share with our accountant. It makes managing taxes so much easier. And we all need to take advantage of that. It might seem obvious to some, but to others it's not. And I want to encourage all of our listeners to take advantage of those those tools out there. One last question, Clark, before we talk about your approach to lighting, because I mean, even as I've continued to look at your work here as, as we're talking, I, I'm quite enamored, honestly, like it, you're it is it is so beautifully done. And so Thank we're going to we're going to learn more about how you do that in a second. But last quick question for you. Favorite book, self-help book or business book that you would recommend to our listeners? Well, I was trying to I'm, I'm be totally honest and transparent here. I'm not the biggest reader. I mean, Fair I'm, I'm a, I'm a visual person, okay, and, okay. but I do, there are sometimes I'll get magazines and read them and I'm a member of PPA and I get their magazine each month and sure. there's times I'll thumb through there and read articles and things. But the one book that really stands out to me and, and like I said earlier, when I had to make the transition, when I was doing in-person sales, raising my prices and everything and having a studio and wanting it to be different than everybody. The book that really helped me with that was the one by Sarah Petty called Worth Every Penny. And it's um, about, it's more of a, about a business with a boutique business model. 
And I don't know that I would say I'm totally majorly boutique because I've seen some that really are. But um, but on the other hand, compared to a lot of, uh, and I say my competitors, the I I don't know that I feel like I have competitors because we all do things so different and everybody has their own unique styles. Sure. So somebody people come to me because they like the style that I shoot or mm-hmm. they like the images that I'd have. They may go to somebody, you know, an hour or two away from me because they like what they do. And we all do different things. But one of the things I like about this book was it helped me do little things that made a difference to people. I mean, like I even I mean I've got basic bags but I order stickers with my logo on them, slap them on the bag. And when I get albums and I slap a sticker on the album box and they're, it just, it's little things like, I know when my wife and daughter go shopping, I mean, they've gone to, we took our daughter to a Kendra Scott store for her birthday. And I was just watching them when they were packaging it all up. I thought that is just something extra, you know, yeah. yep. it's like you got a present when you, you walk out the store. Exactly. It's just really neat. Yeah. So those little things like that, I try to do with, with certain things like when I do my sports orders and things, it's a totally different ball of wax. Um, so, I mean, I treat the same with the lighting and stuff. I just do it much quicker (laughs) because there's a lot more people. Well, as you were talking, I I brought up that book, uh, by Sarah Petty and Aaron Verbeck worth every penny build a business that thrills your customers and still charge Mm -hmm. what you're worth. And we'll make sure to link to this in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. And I, you know, I, I don't say this enough, uh, Clark, but I actually have, we have a, a resource um, for your information, but also for our listeners as well, Boca Bookshelf. So anybody listening in or watching, mm-hmm. if you go to Boca, B-O-K-E-H, bookshelf.com, it's a collection of the most popular books mentioned here in over 500 episodes on the podcast. For those of you that might be looking for something to read, go check it out because we've had some really great recommendations. I'll just throw that out there, but we'll also link to Aaron... Uh, and Sarah's book in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. And it's really thin, so. (laughs) Easy read, easy read. That's the way to go. (laughs) I like books that are thin. So (laughs) like, hey, I can read that really pretty quick, you know. Oh, that's great. Well, Clark, I want want to, as we kind of transition to this this conversation about your lighting, I'm going to actually jump back over here to actually, first of all, your Instagram account. I'm just going to scroll a little bit in case anybody is watching. And I know we have actually quite a few people watching live. Um, those of you that are, that are not watching live, you're listening to the audio after the fact, make sure you go to Clark Sanders on Instagram and then also to Clark Sanders photography on, uh, on the web, of course, on the internet, <laughs> Clark's website. Uh, but Clark, I'm going to actually jump back here as we're talking about this before we get into the, the technical details of your lighting and reiterate something that you said earlier. I mean, I love, it, it's easy to talk about being intentional, right? And it's kind of a, a, a cliche thing almost these days to, to, to say, go be intentional about this or that. But you said earlier that you set the intention to bring and even talk about it in your website that you want to bring cinematic lighting to your photography. And I'm looking at this picture of, again, who I'm assuming is a senior, photographed mm-hmm. in a creek. You can tell there's ambient light in the background, but the way that you handle this, it looks like a studio, like like the person, like you had this creek in your studio. It's so mm-hmm. beautifully lit. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just genuinely impressed by this. It's, I'm Thank really, you. really impressed. It's beautiful stuff. Every time I see images that I've taken in that location, my feet get really cold because that is a <laughs> spring that goes into a river. Yeah. And it, it's, I can only stay in it for so long. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I, yeah. I want to, we're going to get into kind of the technical side of how you make these images happen here in just a second, but let's, and, and, I think the title that we're giving this uh, episode today is dramatic lighting for sports teams. Let's talk Mm -hmm. about what that means to have dramatic lighting. And you also made the comparison and contrast earlier to natural light photography, but how would you define this word dramatic first? To me, it's a use of shadows because there's people that use uh, studio lighting and they can, you know, use it outside or whatever. And you can flat light somebody or it's just a matter of what flatters your subject. And I, have always been drawn to just really dramatic, moody looking portraits, even ones in the studio. So like his, I mean, all, all Rembrandt lighting is like my favorite. So it's just, you know, I'm always moving around so I can get, get the lighting just right. But um, there are sometimes I don't, I mean, I want to do this. That's the same kid that was in the Creek there. 
Okay. Okay. So yep. it, he was fun to photograph because he like you could light him any direction and he'd look good. But um, but yeah, and you, but you had him here in the studio, but then you also had him outdoors and. And I mean, again, the, the way that you're able to just move from one context or one scene to the next is, is super impressive. Back outside again here. I, yeah, I mean, this the lighting is is so beautifully handled and it's also subtle too. like when we talk about dramatic lighting, a lot of times you'll see photographers work. Uh, I shouldn't say a lot of times, but in some cases you see photographers work and you have this extreme lighting, extreme contrast to your earlier point, the shadows and, and lights mm -hmm. where, where they go to the extreme with that. And. I, the subtlety of the way that you're handling your light is also super impressive to me. I can see what you're talking about though. There's the shadows, the contrast that you're creating with shadows and light and it's so beautiful done, but it's simultaneously subtle and just ultimately impactful. So in that sense, to me, it's also dramatic. It's just, it grabs mm -hmm. your attention and you just want to sit there at, at least as a photographer anyway, and, mm -hmm. and just, try to figure out how in the world you did it. So we're going to get to that mm -hmm. here in just a second, mm -hmm. actually. But I wonder just for the sake of our listeners, what would you say would be your top three sources of either education or inspiration as a photographer when it came to learning how to light your images better? Well, like I had said earlier, um, Zach Arias, he used to do a in-person workshop. It was called the One Light Workshop. But then he also sold, and I think it's on, he may have it on his website. There's a downloaded, you can download it now, but it's a version two. And it just explained lighting so to me, it was in simple way to, you know, how to do it. He covered technical things and I am not technical at all when it comes to a lot of it. I mean, there's, there's some people that geek out over lighting ratios and all this stuff, like how far you're how, measuring, how far your light is from your subject and all that kind of stuff. I'm just like, if, does it look good? You know, if I want to move it here, move it there, turn it up, turn it down. So I'm, I, I like to keep it simple. And a lot of that time, keeping it simple, I'm using only one light. There are times when I'll use two, yeah. you know, if I'm somewhere that it will, will, that it works. But but his videos, and then he also had a class on Creative Live that um, was called the um, I want to say it's the Foundations of a Working Photographer or something like that. Um, it was also really good. Um, he his was good, and then. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a member of PPA, and they have a ton of educational resources on their website for their okay. members, and a lot of that's videos. Mm. And I, I'm a visual learner, and but you can learn by reading also because Zach's um, when I got the DVD it had a little companion book, and it showed the lighting diagrams and things like that. So it was it was pretty pretty neat. But a big part of it too is practicing it i mean mm -hmm. you can watch videos all day long until you're doing it and then make you know making sure and you get the more you do something especially with this the more confident you are with it you know you know like the other day or actually yesterday i thought what is going on because every time i took a photo it was just overexposed i couldn't figure out what was going on well my camera is one of the mirrorless cameras it's got a touch screen on the back Apparently, I bumped the ISO setting to auto and <laughs> just jacked everything up, you know. Yeah. But yeah. I knew I, I have to always tell myself, slow down and think of what's going on. And, and then when you do that, you don't panic. And it's like, okay, it's happened to me before. I'll reset it to what I need mm -hmm. to reset it to. But, but it's he, funny he, too is, because he is a main one. Well, there's... When it comes to photography, I mean, it can be easy to get technical for sure. Zach was mm -hmm. a brilliant example. And I remember Zach from back in the day. Uh, I think he was at the time anyway, based out of Atlanta. And you mm -hmm. kind of heard his name all over the place. And uh, I, I'd love to hear the impact that he made even this many years later. I think it's really cool. And by the way, for anybody listening mm -hmm. in or, or watching again, for that matter, if you go to Zach, Z-A-C-K-A-R-I-A-S, ZachArias.com, um, you can see Zach's work there. We'll, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. But I there's... At the end of the day, for, for even a really great photograph, there are only so many variables that we have to actually consider. And mm. when, as you point out, Clark, we just sit and think about it for a second. Um, we, can, we can pretty much narrow down what the culprit might be if we're running into issues pretty quickly. My daughter actually just went the other day, last night or night before, with, went out with her friends, and she took an old Nikon D300 with her. And she came home, and we were looking through the pictures, which is super fun. And, um, and then she was like, oh, it's, it's getting blurry here, having this issue. And, and so I was able to just kind of slowly, and it took a second, 
like it was muscle memory holding that camera because I shot Nikon all of my career. Uh, mm -hmm. But it took a second to kind of get back in the technical side of things. But then I could briefly and, and simply explain to her what settings she needed to adjust, what what settings to use the next time in order to mitigate the problems that, that she was seeing as she was out photographing. Mm -hmm. And it was super fun. Um, a little yeah. bit of problem solving there. But it, there are only so mm -hmm. many variables that we have to consider at the end of the day. And I, I like that you mm -hmm. highlight Zach's work largely because it, it, it's a brilliant example of how you really can create beautiful imagery in a very, very simple manner. We don't have to get overtly technical. We don't have mm -hmm. to get super complicated and have 68 different pieces of gear in order to create a beautiful, beautiful image. And I think that's a really great reminder. One quick question just to kind of tag onto that. You mentioned videos earlier and you actually told me before we started that you like to, to watch YouTube videos about photography. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular YouTuber that you follow right now that you would recommend to our listeners? Oh gosh. There's so many that I subscribe to, and I'm trying to think some off the top of my head. Um, there's, I mean, a lot of people get hung up on gear and like what brand of lights they use and this and that. Um, but there are several different ones that I've been watching on. I've, I've recently got some Ellen Chrome uh, modifiers that I absolutely love. Okay. And on their um, channel, there's mm. um, some fashion photographers from New York. And one of them's, um, oh, what's her name? Emily Teague, I think is her name. Okay. And she has done some one light portraits with those. And um, I'm a big, I'm a big Sue Bryce fan and Felix Coons. And so there, there's some, I've, I've got a, a, his course. He's got a, a lighting uh, course through her portrait masters site. And that's really good too, but um, good grief. <laughs> Well, you know what I can we'll make do? a mile long list of, <laughs> of people because all this because YouTube is like a lot of social media things. The more you watch certain videos than you see. That's true. Other suggestions. You it's, know, so. it's very true. Well, I think we've given our listeners and viewers a couple of options to, to look at. And um, mm -hmm. we'll link to those in the show notes at bookapodcast.com. I want to jump to the, the primary content at hand, though, Clark, and that is mm -hmm. your approach, your technique. And I, I, you mentioned to me that you've got kind of three main concepts, two or three main concepts mm -hmm. that are driving what it is that you're doing with your lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would love for you to kind of dig into each of those with us. And I'm, you're going to see me maybe with a pen as I take notes here okay. with our listeners. But go ahead and, and share what those three main ideas are, and then we'll kind of dig into each of them in detail. Okay. And well, as I get started, because I love... I love lighting and studio lighting and looking even for natural light. And the reason I chose the room that I'm sitting in because I have a window here and I thought, oh, the, wind, the light's going to be nice and soft, but it is like cloudy out today and it's getting <laughs> bright out and it gets dark out. It gets bright and dark. So I was like, I've I got think this that MacBook... major, really bright spot on my forehead. Right now. <laughs> I was telling you before we got started, so. I think the camera is trying to compensate for the fact that you're wearing a black shirt. And so then it's blowing out your skin tones, which yeah. is a bit of an ironic thing considering your talent with light. Um, but yeah, it's and okay. I chose that background because it's a it's one of my darker ones. And I thought, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe it'll help. So yeah, no worries now, at all. Let's jump yeah. in. Okay. Yeah. What I, what I do a lot of times, I mean, even like for natural light photographers, when you're outside, you expose your camera for the ambient light but you also want to make sure your subject is in a you know some good light and most of the time i try to find a place when i'm doing you know more natural light portraits where it's like an open shade not you're not totally in deep into the trees or something where there's no lighting direction but with a studio light you can bring your own light and make your own lighting direction so my main thing i do first is i set my camera it's all a manual is I set the ambient exposure for how I want it to look. Hmm. If I want it to be really dark and moody, I underexpose the image quite a bit. If mm -hmm. I don't, I I don't. I just hmm. keep it where it's. And I take a test shot and see where my how my subject looks in the image. And there are times when I I was doing a session the day before yesterday, and the location we were in, the ambient light was gorgeous. So I just I got some pictures with just the ambient light. But then I thought, okay, I'm going to do my thing and uh, underexpose it a little bit. And then I set my light up, usually off to one side or the other. And it depends, the, the side I put it on depends on, mainly with girls, if their hair is parted on one side or the other. So it's not casting a shadow with their hair. Okay. okay. And then it's usually off, and I'll usually feather it quite a bit. And then I just turn the light on. And I don't use a meter. I've got one. I know how to use it, but I don't use it. 
Um, I turn the light on, and if it's too bright, I turn the power down. And if it's too dark, I turn it up. It's a matter of keeping it that simple until I get an image that looks the way I want it to look. And if, you know, and I move it around as far as the lighting direction too. If I think, okay, the light's too, there's too harsh of a shadow, I'll move the light around a little bit. But as far as the settings go on the camera, there's no set, there's no, I mean, you can't just set your camera, hey, I want to shoot at this f-stop, this shutter speed, and be done. Because it just depends on the location you're shooting in. There may be an area that's, I mean, I've done pictures, like for baseball portraits, I'll go out in the middle of the day at noon and do a senior session. There may be, there's some on my Instagram, and they look like they were done, you know, in a really later in the day, but in all honesty, they were in the middle of the day. But I'll just underexpose the scene quite a bit and use make sure the flash that I'm using is powerful enough that it'll, you know, light the face up. And that that football player right there is a good example because I did his baseball portraits in the middle of the day. This one was taken obviously later in the day because the football field's covered with the shadow of the trees that was behind us. But I just exposed, I wanted to get the bleachers, you know, where they weren't blown out and you could sure. still see the sky. Yep. And I just stuck a studio light over there and turned it on. And I'll, I'll fluctuate depending on how I want my image to look, if I use high speed sync or not. You know, there's times that I'll, I'll use it and sometimes I don't. And I used to be a big, before the flashes I have now are all high speed sync capable. The ones I used to have were not. And so I used um, ND filters a lot to, to shoot more wide open. Okay, so we've we've touched on, and I was taking notes um, a little furiously actually as as you're talking because you've <laughs> you've hit on a number of interesting points, and I want to kind of get back to each of them. For anybody who might be taking notes, I, I'm a little bit of a nerd, Clark, and I'm like I'm super structured when it comes to taking notes, um, it, down to the point that I don't know if you still do this or not, but like I I learn how to outline, you know, for an English paper, for example, like with the Roman numeral. And then the capital A, and then the number mm -hmm. one, and then the lowercase a, and breaking it down like that. I still do that <laughs> to this day. Anyway, oh, wow. <laughs> that aside, uh, I, I wrote down kind of four main talking points here based on what you were just talking about. First of all, was the use of ambient light. Secondly, mm -hmm. placement of your your actual light, your your uh, studio light. Number three was camera settings, and um, and then number four was favorite gear. You didn't specifically say that, but I actually want to come back to this because of course, naturally photographers want to know what lights you're using in this case. So we'll mm -hmm. come back to that. I think probably we could tie camera settings and use of ambient light uh, together, but we'll, we'll treat them separately. So first of all, when you're talking about use of ambient light for maybe an experienced photographer who has extensive training, maybe similar to yours, Clark, they may understand the principle that you were talking about just now, but when we were looking and let me actually jump back to your Instagram and we'll pull this picture back up because it's, it's a great example of this very thing. When you're talking about exposing for the background, the ambient light first, I, I love the simple notion of this. And again, it's a beautiful example of how photography doesn't have to be overtly technical and at least not overwhelmingly. So if we're working with a, a, a off camera light, a studio light or otherwise, but we also want to beautifully expose the background. The first thing to do, as you're pointing out, is to expose for that background, expose for the ambient light. And you've got a challenging situation in this case in that you've got what is going to be pretty harsh, looks like sunset light on those bleachers, which could easily get blown out. And then mm -hmm. if that happens, naturally the sky, you're, you're going to lose the, the saturation and the blues in that sky. That's going to get blown out. But instead, you exposed for that first. Now, you said you don't use a light meter. So are you just doing this in camera and just manually adjusting your settings? I am. You, uh, like my well, mirrorless cameras, you'll see you can get a live view, live view. Yeah. of what it's going to look. So yeah. that's what I try to do first. Okay. And before I had the mirrorless camera, I would just look at the meter in the camera and then make sure it was under it, either... I would hardly ever use the meter in camera when I was, you know, try to shoot natural light on my subject. But I would try to make sure it was like center or underexposed by a couple of little, not stops or do the little dots, whatever, you know, <laughs> just to make sure it was just enough. And I'd take a test shot and see what it looked like. Yeah. And if I didn't like the way it looked, then I would change it. 
So, well, and for anybody but, listening uh, in, just for your point of reference, if you want to see this picture that we're talking about, if you go to Clark Sanders, C L A R K S A N D E R S, Clark Sanders on Instagram, and go to the September 26th, or excuse me, 22nd post. Uh, and it is um, an individual who is ho- holding both a football helmet and then a bat, multi sport athlete, multi talented. But it's really a great example of what, what it is that we're talking about. I want to jump to one other example, Clark, that we did. Uh, that we were discussing earlier, actually, and that is back on your website. So pulling this back up, how did you expose for the ambient light here? You mentioned earlier that sometimes you will stop it down just a little bit, darken the background mm-hmm. a little bit. Did you do that here? What was the process? Yep, I did the same kind of thing. It's like I got, usually I know in my head, like, okay, most cameras have a, a sync speed they can go to. It's usually it's 160th, 200 or 250th or whatever. So your flash won't sync right if you're going above that. Um, but in this area here, I, I always like to have the background out of focus quite a bit. So I usually, I very rarely shoot wide open like at 2.8 or whatever my lens may do, but somewhere close to it so I can get that set. Um, and then I, I just take a, I take a lot of random test shots and I tell people, and I usually get some funny ones too, because when they know I'm taking a test shot, they're going to be crazy acting and make funny faces. So <laughs> I'm getting some pretty decent, you know, stuff for them there. Absolutely. But yeah, I, like that one in particular, I can't remember. I'd have to pull up my file on my computer to see what it was, but you know, the shutter speed was probably 200, if not a little bit more than that. And then I had my light sitting in the creek thankfully it wasn't real deep and swift so i wasn't worried about it you know going over but the little light modifier i think was a pretty small one um but i just had it right i actually had it right out of frame because usually i keep that's another thing i do is i try to keep my light and my light modifier as close as i can to my subject without it being in the shot and so that's that's one of those technical things the inverse square law and sure. that's one of those things where I'm like, I didn't, I was not a good math student when I was in high school. <laughs> so either. when people yeah. explain that to me, I'm like, okay, yeah. I fog over. And it's like, <laughs> I understand the principle of it, Sure. but it's a matter of the fall off of the light, you know? Sure. So, but so that's a big part of it. Basically to get maximizing the, the potential power of, of the light without having mm-hmm. to probably go to full power in order to light somebody, especially in, in an outdoor scene like that. Sometimes you're competing with pretty bright background light. Mm-hmm. If you're able to bring it in closer, it helps kind of minimize that, that, that challenge, I would assume. Okay. So yeah. and then I, another thing I learned too, is like yeah. the larger your modifier is and the closer it is, the softer the light's going to be. So mm. that little modifier I think I was using for him was maybe 20, I think it's a 25 inch little thing. So it okay. wasn't real, real big, but I got it in as close as I could. So. Okay. So I, again, I'm just referencing my notes here, but we, we start with the use of ambient light. And, and I, I love the simple way that you explain your approach there. And for anybody who's new to photography or maybe is not used to, maybe they consider themselves a natural light photographer, they want to start using a light of some kind on, on location, just very simply exposing for that ambient light first, adjusting a little bit if they want to make it a little bit more moody or less moody, mm-hmm. uh, and then figuring out the flash settings Just a very great, simple approach. And Mm -hmm. the beauty, of course, you talked about shooting film. I did for the first, oh, I don't know, at least three years or so, maybe more, Mm -hmm. actually, of my career as well. And when you switch to digital, the fact that you could just freely experiment is so, it's such a wonderful thing. So we've got Mm -hmm. an advantage in that sense. But then secondly, the placement of the light, and you were just alluding to this. So close, um, Mm -hmm. right off camera, and then are are you usually shooting for about a 45 degree angle to the subject, or does that depend as well? Mm It sometimes depends. Most of the time I am. I like to keep it about 45, tilted 45, and just to see how the shadow looks. Um, another photographer that, I mean, it just come to my head, that our, uh, uh, Zach was a big influence on his, his lighting. I say like we're on a first name basis. I've never met the man. Um, <laughs> but another one that I really love his lighting is Joey L., um, Joey Lawrence. Um, and he's got a YouTube channel and he's got several different things. He's got some behind the scenes, um, videos that he's done, but a lot of times it's just a matter of the light placement and how it's angled. And it just sometimes can really yield a really good, good looking image. One of the things I try to keep it as, as far as the lighting goes, the placement of it and everything, I try to keep it as simple as I can. When people are learning flash, one of the most 
technical things and probably the most difficult to grasp is actually the flash and figuring out the settings on it. Like where, you know, how do you change it to manual mode and where do you turn it up here and where do you turn it there and how do you make the trigger talk to the flash? Those are the things that once you get used to it, it's kind of like driving a car. When you're changing lanes and you hit your turn your turn signal on or turn your headlights on, so many things like that are just second nature to you. And once you get a flash system and learn how they work and how they talk to each other and all the settings on those, that right there is, to me, one of the biggest roadblocks to a lot of people is, and it was me, was when I first started using a studio light outside, it was too stressful for me i was like okay i'm wasting these people's time trying to figure out this light and so i'll just go back to my default of shooting natural light outside and i was comfortable in the studio but once i figured out how to control the flash and the output of it and making myself slow down when i would get a little stressed then it made a world of difference <laughs> Well, and to, to your point about Joey L too, and I had this pulled up as you were talking uh, for anybody listening in or watching, if you go to Joey, J-O-E-Y-L, just literally the letter L.com, mm -hmm. um, you can see the, the beautiful work that, that Clark is talking about. Wonderful examples mm -hmm. too, that subtle lighting, Clark. That, yeah. Frankly, I mean, this is, I see a lot of, of what you're doing in his work or vice versa. Um, it, it's, you see the direction, you see the contrast in those portraits, but, mm -hmm. but it's there and it's, it's super yeah. impactful. So that, I, I th those, those right there are, those are some of my absolute favorite type of portraits. Mm. I just love the way it looks because mm -hmm. you can tell it's lit, but it doesn't, you can't tell, is it really lit with artificial light or right. was it just good direction of natural light? Yeah. Just, so exactly. Okay. Well, these are, these are great examples. So then I want to jump to the, uh, the next point, which is camera settings. And again, you've kind of alluded to this throughout the conversation. I guess one of the questions that I would have, you mentioned earlier that that portrait of the senior in the Creek 200, uh, one two hundredth of a second shutter speed mm -hmm. in that particular scenario. And I know it's going to vary from scene to scene depending on the light, but mm -hmm. what type of ISO are you usually trying to shoot with outside? Or are you doing so intentionally or is it just really simply mm -hmm. depend on the scene? I would say probably 75 to 80% of the time I'm shooting at ISO 100. And there are times, like in the middle of the day, if I'm really wanting to get a really moody sky and get it really underexposed, then I'll go down to the low ISO setting are basically like 50 on my, you know, ISO settings to get it a little darker. But most of the time it's usually that I'll bump it up if there's days that it's really overcast and kind of dark out. Like this time of year, it starts getting darker out earlier. So I'll sometimes have to bump my ISO up to 200 or um, the day before yesterday, I was in an area that, was actually very pretty. It was one of our state parks, but it was in a little, like a cavernous area, but it, we, I bumped it up to 400 then, and then you just have to compensate with the light. So and is that tendency to go to the lower ISO? Is that kind of from your film days? Cause I, I you know, the your traditional portrait photographer trying to get the, the richest possible color is going to go for that lower ISO. Is mm -hmm. that part of where that comes from? Possibly. Okay. Because when I was shooting film, the only time I used the studio light was indoors. And I, if I did anything outside, it was all natural light with film. So, but I would, my film speed was all, I'd always, and I still have some of my um, wish list on B&H. It's Kodak Portrait, like 160 yep. film. <laughs> yeah. That's what we used, that's part of what we used to shoot with actually for the portrait work that, that we did. I love Kodak Portra. I know that they're, mm -hmm. it's like Nikon versus Canon, like they're different camps, Fuji yeah. and, and, um, uh, and, and then ultimately Kodak, of course, and mm -hmm. maybe one or two others. But that for me, when it came to color, I love the way that colors were rendered through that mm -hmm. to the Kodak photo. We would shoot with 160, 400 up to 800 on the color side. Um, but I, yeah, that was just a favorite of mine. Anyway, I, I could yeah. ramble on for that for, for a while, mm -hmm. but speaking of equipment less and your favorite equipment, let me kind of jump to that real quick too. Let's talk a little bit about the light that you use. And do you mm -hmm. use, is there kind of a go-to light that you're using as your artificial light, your off-camera light, or do you have two or three that you're going to? Well, I use the um, Godox lights. Or one of them is Godox or, and then Flashpoint from Adorama. They're, base, they're the same thing. They're just rebranded. 
um, yesterday. It, it just depends where I'm at. I've got the Godox, they're 8200, it's a 200 watt second light. And some of the areas where I was shooting, it was more than enough power. Um, but this, the senior that I shot yesterday, he was a catcher for their baseball team. We were going to be out on the baseball field and I was like, okay, it was getting cloudy. So I probably didn't need a whole lot of power, but I had my 8600 light, which is a lot more powerful. So I thought I'm going to use that. And just so I'd have enough to underexpose the, the situation because the, the field, their baseball field in October is in, not in the condition that it will be when they start playing ball. So it didn't look the greatest. So I wanted to underexpose it as much as I could. So you couldn't tell how, I guess, weedy the ground was. <laughs> okay. There was a lot of, a lot of weeds popping up. So yeah. I had to, I had to do a little lawn mowing in Photoshop. Okay. Some. So, but yeah, it just depends on where I'm photographing. If, you know, if I know I'm going to, if it's going to be a really overcast day, I don't need a lot of power. Those 8,200 lights are pretty powerful. So, yeah, and I actually brought that up while you were talking, the AD200, Godox, G-O-D-O-X, mm -hmm. for anybody who's curious, A-D, the letters A-D, and then the number 200, the pocket flash. And are you, are you shooting these with internal batteries, or is it an external battery pack that you're bringing with you? How are you no, doing that? They all, they're all built-in batteries. Okay. That's one of the things I liked about them, because before I used, started using these, I used Alien B lights, and I had their external battery pack that I would take with me on location. Um, but these are so nice cause you can, I mean, I've got two of those. So usually if one of them's not fully charged one, the other one is. So I'm packing one of those with me. And then I bought, um, this last year, their step up from that, the 8300, which is just a little bit more powerful. So I'll have one or both with me. So I always like to have a spare. So I always have a spare camera with me just in case something were to happen. Well, and speaking of, I mean, I've got this pulled up on Amazon right now, the Godox 8200. And of course, this has been one of the, 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 I guess the attractions to this brand is the price point. I mean, 299, mm -hmm. we'll call it 300 bucks for mm -hmm. a flash that you can, that has built in battery. I mean, that, in fact, that the list of features, I'll go back over to their site. It's pretty incredible. I mean, like you said, mm -hmm. plenty of power there. 500 flashes apparently with a built-in battery, quick recycle time, mm -hmm. 2.4 gig wireless um, or remote control. And I mean, the list goes on. It's, it's really incredible. And you could do this for 300 bucks. And I just think back mm -hmm. to like when we were buying the, of course we were shooting Nikon, but the Nikon speed lights were, mm -hmm. I mean, now if you try to go buy one of those, I think it's five, 600 bucks or something like that for one of oh, the branded yeah. ones. And, and you may not even be getting all the features that you're getting for like half the price, mm -hmm. which is pretty mm -hmm. amazing. And that was another thing going back to Zach Arias when he would describe lighting and things. It, mm. it, one of the things I liked about how he described it is light is light. You just mm -hmm. got to know how to use it. Yeah. And there are people that are brand specific. There's people that love to use pro photo. I had bought and thought I would try Ellen Chrome lights and I, I got one and I, I liked it, but I'm so used to using the Godox and the interface there it was so much easier. But when I did that, I got one of their modifiers and was kind of hooked on their modifiers because I love the light quality from it. Sure. But and to me, it's like with a camera, it's like I'm not I shoot a certain brand of camera, but it's a matter of taste. I mean, you and certain people like a certain brand of car. You know, it's just a matter of how you I mean, I like the way things it's easy for me to find the menus on the camera system I have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just a matter of choice. It doesn't make I don't think it makes someone a better photographer than the other. Like yesterday, the mother of the senior was talking about, oh, that's so good. Your, ca your camera did such a good job, you know? And I didn't <laughs> say it in a way to make it sound like I was dissing her or anything, but I said, yeah. you know, it's, it's a matter of knowing how to use the tools you have. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I said, you don't go to a family member's house at Thanksgiving and they've cooked this wonderful meal. You compliment them on their skills, because you don't say, oh, man, you must have a really good stove to cook that <laughs> dinner, you know? It yeah. don't work like that. No. It's just a knowing what tools you have, regardless of the brand, you know? That's it. So well, too many I, people get caught up in that. I remember Zach, 
I specifically remember Zach back in the day shooting with, and I, I wish I could remember it was like a sun pack or something like that, but like a $60, yeah. $80 yeah. manual, like nothing fancy, no automatic, no LCD screen on the back. Just super, super mm -hmm. simple flash. And I would yeah. venture he probably did it intentionally just to prove the very point that you were, you just mentioned, which is it's yeah, yeah sure. Oh. There are different brands and, and options and features and lay you know, ergonomic layouts and mm -hmm. so forth that we get comfortable with. And we might even find more user-friendly, but at the end of the day, if you know the basics, really shouldn't mm -hmm. matter too much what gear you're using you can still make mm -hmm. it happen and yeah. that's that is important to to note but i, I will give godox a shout out because i've bought I'm trying to think of how many flashes i bought nonetheless i know it's a super popular brand and um certainly popular amongst photographers not only for its price point but ultimately i mean the feature set's really really incredible so we'll mm -hmm. link to the 8200 mm -hmm. too in the show notes for mm -hmm. uh, those listening in and watching and clark we've hit the hour mark you, you've, oh. you've brought a lot to this conversation today i mean not only I can keep going <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you could we may have to come back to the to the ips conversation because it sounds like you've got a lot going on in your head about that too yeah. but uh, this has been super practical, super helpful. And, and I just, I, I really appreciate you making time to share with our listeners and ultimately sharing your work too. Will you just remind our listeners again, where they can find and follow you online here before we go? Sure. Um, my, my website is clarksandersphotography.com and I'm on Instagram as at Clark Sanders. Facebook, I've got a Facebook for my business. It's Clark Sanders Photography. I'm pretty much Clark Sanders everywhere. So perfect. Well, we're going to link to all this in the show notes, bocapodcast.com. We thank you everybody for listening in, for watching, and um, we'll see everyone at the next podcast. Thanks again, Clark. Really appreciate oh, it. Thank you. Again, right. it was an honor to get invited. I appreciate it. Truly our privilege. Everybody, thanks for listening. We'll make sure to listen or link to, to Clark's sites in the show notes, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.